Item number SCP-093. Index Red Sea Object. Object class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. See Testing Document SCP-093-T1 for outline of testing conditions. SCP-093 must remain on a mirror at all times and under video surveillance. Admittance into the area of SCP-093's containment must be authorized only with proper video recording and subject retrieval procedures in place. Any attempt to use SCP-093 outside of an approved test will be dealt with severely, up to and including termination. Description SCP-093 is a primarily red disc carved from a stone composite resembling cinnabar, with circular engravings and unknown symbols carved at 0.5 cm depth around the entire object. Deeper cuts are present on SCP-093, with a depth of 1 to 1.5 cm. SCP-093 is 7.62 cm in diameter, and fits comfortably into most palms without abrasion. SCP-093 will change hue when held by a living individual. The colors taken by SCP-093 are still being researched to establish a link. Current belief holds that the changes depend upon regrets carried by the holder. If SCP-093 is removed from a mirror and not held by a person, it will seek out the nearest mirror-like surface. SCP-093 has been observed to travel in the largest possible circle while rolling, building up phenomenal speed. The mechanism of this acceleration is currently unknown. If an obstacle is between SCP-093 and the nearest mirror-like surface, it will use this momentum to punch through the obstacle and continue on its course at this speed. It will only stop when a mirror-like surface is contacted. Despite tremendous impact velocities, no damage will be dealt to SCP-093 or the mirror. Additional notes. No records exist to clarify the nature of SCP-093's discovery or presence in the Foundation. See SCP-093-OD. Since no records exist explaining SCP-093's method of containment, a test procedure was initiated to establish why mirrors must be used to contain it. The results of SCP-093-T1 led to the discovery of living beings holding SCP-093 being able to move through mirrors, and the series of tests in SCP-093-T2 to ascertain the destination reached through this travel. Show SCP-093 original documentation. Item number SCP-093 Object class Euclid Special containment procedures Item SCP-093 is to be kept on a silver-lined mirror on a 0.3 by 0.23 meter 1 foot by 9 inches pedestal at least 1.2 meters 4 foot off the ground floor in containment cell block. Object is not to be contained in areas exceeding 3.66 by 3.05 meters 12 by 10 feet nor placed on mahogany, pine, cherry or aluminum pedestals above or below level 1 of containment cell block. Object can be handled safely, albeit gently, without consequences. Tests and consequences thereof involving containment conditions can be viewed in section B35-1 of the attached report. Description Object was found on the shore of the Red Sea, 30 January 1968, emitting a low sigh and a dim blue gleam. Its color has since turned into an orange mix of red, only emitting a hum of varying volume whilst in the presence of female examiners of ages between 34 and 41. SCP-093 resembled the documented blue for 5434 at 123 on 26 April 1986, coincidentally when the body of 194-9834 was discovered in research facility. Ties between 194-9834 and SCP-093 remain inconclusive, and effects of prolonged exposure to 093 remain unknown, except for infrequent reports of periods of calmness, and in the case of 242-0049, as periodic waves of depression, loss of balance, and thoughts of suicide. These feelings have reportedly not exceeded 11 days in duration. Object seemed to react to the presence of 242-0056 by turning light violet for no more than 209, as documented on 12 March 1993. Effects of this reaction remain unknown. Additional notes. Origins of 093 remain unknown, and documents of recovery of 093 have since been destroyed in a fire in research facility. 09 December 1989. Reports on the feelings of researchers who handled 093 have remained inconsequential since 19 April 1995. SCP 093 T1 Containment Test. Testing of SCP 093 against conditions set forth for existing containment procedures to assess viability of continuing such containment. 
beginning with changing the type of mirror used as a position of rest. Mirrored surface, brass frame, retail grade mirror. SCP-093 rests without activity when placed on the mirror. This test alone removes the need for costly silver or wooden containment systems. Standard grade table. SCP-093 turns upright and begins to roll across the table surface in one direction, making a U-turn and rolling to the other, completing an oval shape, and repeating this action until the mirror is brought into vicinity of it, at which time SCP-093 rolls toward the mirror and lays flatways against it, sliding toward the center. It is noted that despite the grainy feel of SCP-093, it does not mark the mirror in any fashion while moving across it. Two mirrors at either end of a standard grade table. SCP-093 gravitates towards the closer mirror, regardless of orientation, and makes no distinction between different types of mirrors, favoring a factor of distance above all else in choosing the mirror to move to. A mirror held by a person and moved around. SCP-093 follows the mirror as it moves, gaining speed until the maximum velocity of is reached. At any velocity, the impact of SCP-093 against a mirrored surface results in no damage to either object. A person holding SCP-093, placing it on a mirror. This test was accidental, the result of one of the staff tripping another after some debate about who would be covering the lunch tab. As a result of the behavior of the researchers, it was discovered that a person holding SCP-093 and placing it against a mirror will in fact move into the mirror. Addendum. Containment testing discontinued after establishing that SCP-093 requires only a mirror to rest inert. Testing on human interaction with mirrors while holding SCP-093 authorized by Dr. SCP-093-T2 Mirror Test Testing Protocols Subjects testing SCP-093 must wear a Class 3 buckle harness strapped to the chest and attached to a tension pulley system, allowing for a 300 meter circa 1,000 foot of movement. Additional spools may be added to extend movement if necessary. The clasps connecting these spools must be high-grade and capable of withstanding applied force of 0.2 tons. A field kit containing the following should be standard issue for testing of SCP-093. 1. 1. Wrist-mounted light source with 3. 3. Hours lifespan and additional power sources providing up to 6. 6. Additional hours. 4. 4. 0 0.5 liter water bottles with water. 4. 4. MREs of any type, plus 2. 2. Plain granola bars, chocolate chips allowed. 1. 1. Standard issue, Beretta 9mm firearm with 24. 2. 4. Rounds of ammunition loaded. This is not to be issued until subject has passed into the mirror using SCP-093 and should be given under armed supervision, ensuring that the subject passes through entirely. This item is to be requisitioned first upon subject's return, and subject is to be made aware of this before leaving line of sight within SCP-093's mirror. 1. 1. Standard Issue Field Knife The subject is not to be made aware of this item, and must find it on his own within the kit. The subject must also be attached to a video system, with camera mounted on the subject's head or shoulders. The video device should be cable-based, and allow for the same length of travel as the return system. Wireless cameras have shown mixed results and should only be used in testing conditions where SCP-093 is a currently known color. New colors must be tested using wired feed. During testing, the color of SCP-093 must be recorded, as well as history of the subject in terms of the incarceration to identify how SCP-093 determines the color to assume. A link appears to be connected to guilt or a lack thereof in the subject's psyche. The attached test results should be read in order. Access SCP-093 Blue Test Mirror Test 1. Color Blue Subject is D-20348, male, 34 years of age, strong physique. Subject's background shows instance of murder and attempted suicide. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a blue color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to an outdoor landscape heavily tinged in blue. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same field reported by technicians. Looks like typical lowland plains. Everything has a heavy blue tinge overlapping the normal colors. 
No discernible landmarks visible as subject pans view left to right, only grass, weeds, and a breeze moving the taller grass. No trees, no living beings visible. Subject moves forward as instructed, traveling for approximately 500 steps before something becomes visible. A patch of land up ahead is barren, and grass can be seen dying as subject approaches it. Approximately 300 steps forward, subject is standing before a hole in the ground. The hole has been dug using unknown tools of primitive origin. Pulley system engaged, and the camera suffers a light shudder. Subject is instructed to enter the hole, and after mild protesting, agrees to do so. There is no apparent method of descent, such as ladder or rope. Subject relies entirely on his own hands and the pulley system to slow the descent. Approximately 100 meters of cable is used before a bottom is reached. Light source provided in field kit activated 50 meters down when outside sources become unreliable. Sweeping gestures of the light reveal nothing more than dirt, even at the bottom of the hole. Subject moves forward with assistance of light source. Asked about the blue tinge, subject expresses confusion and says there is no tinge from his perspective, and never was. Light is visible down the passage, and 150 meters of cable has been used. Out of the camera's eye, sound is recorded of the firearm being prepared. When questioned about these actions, subject states justified precaution and moves forward. The tunnel turns from bare dirt to a concrete enclosure. Subject complains of a stench. The light source is revealed to be sealing light fixtures, a series of which with less than a quarter broken while the others function. A series of six doors, three to a side, span before the camera view with a seventh door visible at the end of the corridor that has been locked by what looks like generic metal shelving debris. Debris shows signs of rusting and is typical of retail store units suggesting other human presences. Subject requested to try doors, in whatever order he chooses. Subject tries first door on right, door is locked, does not open. Second door tries to open but does not budge, unlocked but blocked. Closing second door, third door is tried, same results as first. Going up the other side, the third door does fully open and light is bright in the room. Portable light switched off at this time as subject pans camera to inspect room. Room is bare, no contents, but walls are filthy. Subject states material on walls isn't dirt, but he can't identify it. Seems to resemble melted plastic, but is brown in color rather than black. Door is closed. Second door on left side has no handle, does not move when pushed. The hole where the handle was is plugged by unknown material. All doors are shaped in such a way that nothing can visibly escape from the sides, and space for movement is too thin to look through, even at ground level. First door on left hand is locked, but part of key is present in lock from stem to the ridges. The back has been broken off. With effort, subject manipulates key to open door and immediately begins coughing, complaining of a stench. Walls of room are clean, as is floor. Ceiling is coated in the same strange brown material as the third room. In this room there is a makeshift cot made from aged blankets with a pillow, a wooden crate containing open boxes of what appears to have been foodstuffs. Language appears on video as squiggles, however subjects state they simply read cereal. A second crate in the room contains what appear to be empty water bottles that have dried out. A book lays next to the cot, closed, no title or identifying marks. On the wall is what appears to be clipped articles, but language cannot be read. Subject asked to remove clippings or retrieval. All articles but one crumble at the touch due to age. The intact article is put in a field sample container and seems the most recent compared to the others. Asked to investigate the book, subject begins to move toward it. Audio on the tape goes strange and a high-pitched screeching noise like grinding metal dominates all communication for 3.5 seconds. Subject has not touched the book still and when the noise stops, subject asks control to repeat request. Control made no requests during that time as headsets were removed. Subject advised to leave room and notes that the door has begun closing slowly on its own and if left alone, will close. Subject advised to leave door alone and to investigate door on right. Careful review of the following 10 seconds of tape shows that as the camera pans, a figure is visible at the end of the tunnel where the seventh door is. The door is open only enough for a face to be seen through a crack just before the door silently closes. No details can be seen. Subject investigates the second door on the right, with no mention of anything seen out of the ordinary. This door, when pushed against, moves, and after repeated bashings, moves enough to view inside at an angle. A cork board is visible with more articles attached to it. The top of a box of cereal can be seen on the floor, and what appears to be a hand laying palm up. Subject closes door and pans camera past door 7, which remains closed. Seeing nowhere else to explore, subject requested to return. Subject poses no protest and complains of ever-increasing stench.
As subject returns back down tunnel, his camera feed does not change or show anomaly. But control reports a sudden surge in cable movement, pulling an additional 100 meters of cable through, before going slack again, and then tightening. Video feed shows subject ascending tunnel slowly while control attempts to verify integrity of the pulley system. Subject requested to stop ascent, but states he is not climbing, the rope is pulling him up. Panic sets in on both sides, and subject informed to ready firearm. Upon reaching top of hole, nothing is visible on camera, and subject reports nothing has changed in landscape. Then begins a return trip, following the path of the cable. Traveling for approximately 900 steps, subject asks how much cable he has used. Control admits they are unsure due to complications, but subject traveled in a straight line to reach the hole, so it should be a straight line back. Subject becomes concerned when he states that more cable is visible now, moving in a 90 degree angle, away from a point in the ground. Subject pans camera around full circle slowly. On film, behind subject, a crowd of 37 countable figures stand silently. Features are unidentifiable, and they are lacking the blue tinge that dominates the landscape. Panic breaks in control again, but subject notes only oddity as being the cable having an angled path. Subject tugs his end of the cable, it is taut and does not move. Control begins to reel in the pulley system, and slack rapidly winds. Watching the angled cable, movement can be seen as grass is disturbed further down the angled portion from the reeling in. Then the line vibrates as it meets resistance and emits a twang from the recoil. Subject's camera pans back along length of cable, which now appears to slowly be allowing more slack, before suddenly all slack is returned and pulley system begins again. Control requests subject return following cable path, and screams are caught on the audio with panic from subject. Five shots fired, as subject aims pistol at something not visible on camera. Control reports being able to see subject returning toward point of origin, while camera shows wire disappearing into a point floating in the air. As subject passes this point, all cable is now in the pulley system, and camera films only the floor. Control reports that the mirror took approximately five seconds to return to a reflection, and SCP-093 remained blue in color until one hour after being recovered from subject. A vile smelling fluid was present on subject's clothes around his hands when firearm was recovered. The fluid dried quickly and was deemed insignificant of study due to lack of quality sample. Control personnel monitoring the mirror state having seen a massive human being crawling on the ground, easily 50 times the size of a normal person, with no facial features and a very short arm reach, pulling itself toward the mirror before it returned to a reflection. Due to proximity, fine details could not be made out but at least one observer noted the being appeared to have been shot from the marks in the otherwise smooth, featureless face. Field test kit recovered from subject containing a newspaper article that reads Data expunged and was filed as item Data expunged. Access SCP-093 Green Test. Mirror test 2. Color. Green. Subject is D54493, female, 23 years of age, average physique. Subject's background shows instance of grand theft auto and second degree murder of two children during escape with vehicle. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a green color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a farming landscape heavily tinged in green, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same farmland reported by technicians. All greens through video feed are deeper, and green tinge overlays the normal colors of objects, similar to the blue tinge in test 1. No landmarks from test 1 are discernible as subject pans camera over area. Present is a field, long abandoned, in the middle of which stands the remains of a scarecrow of unknown design, Fragments left are rotted and torn. Nothing grows in the tilled land. A farmhouse is visible to the right of the field. Large, two stories. A basement shelter entrance is visible at one end. Subject prepares her sidearm immediately and is asked by control to relax before proceeding, her heavy breathing dominating the audio feed. Subject takes a few minutes and announces that she's fine, then proceeds as directed to walk the perimeter of the farmhouse. Children's bicycles, two, a boy and a girl's, lay against the house near the shelter doors. One of the doors to the shelter lay in the grass, torn from the entrance as evidenced by splintering wood. On the stairs lay clothes arranged in a descending order, shoes to shirt going down them, belonging to a boy. Subject begins screaming at Control, asking if this is some sort of sick joke. Control assures her that they have never seen this environment either, and to please calm down. 
Subject takes several minutes to regain herself before continuing. It is unknown if SCP-093 is linking the subject's past with her landscape. After several minutes, subject agrees to continue. Communication to subject is muted, and conversation of control making commentary about subject's jittery attitude make up audio for one and a half minutes. Communication restored as subject reaches bottom of stairs. The cellar of the farmhouse is unremarkable and typical. Several wooden shelves line the far wall containing unidentified canned substances. Broken light fixtures sway gently from support beams. Camera is panned across the basement slowly. No evidence of footprints are visible, and the basement can be assumed to have been abandoned for some time. Subject begins to comment about a stench. As subject pans the area, a metal hatch is visible in the ground, similar to a bulkhead on a submarine with a turn handle. Subject remarks that the smell is at its worst around the hatch, and the dirt around the hatch is noted as being clumped and clay-like. The handle of the hatch is old and the paint chipped. Subject coerced into turning the handle, which, when fully turned, opens the hatch. Subject begins coughing at the release of assumed old, stale air. When camera is tilted to view down the hatch, it is a white concrete tunnel similar to the one found in the blue experiment, but in much better condition. Subject asked to descend ladder and close hatch behind her. After some convincing, subject agrees to descend, but does not close the hatch. Overlooked concerns about severing the pulley return system in doing so are acknowledged. Descent down the ladder and trip to the farmhouse has consumed approximately 53 meters of cable when bottom is reached. The inside of the hatch appears to be a bunker ill-suited to long-term usage. It is spacious, about half the size of the actual cellar itself, containing three bunks, one for a couple and two for single use. Several boxes of food similar to those found during Blue, marked as cereal, fill a waste container near the hatch bottom. On the beds are two skeletons, and on the floor is a third, lying next to which is a simple six-shooter revolver containing no ammunition. Three spent casings are across the floor near the gun. On the other side of this skeleton is a bound book in good condition. This is retrieved and placed into a field kit container upon request. The gun is left alone per request from control. Subject examines more of the bunker, focusing on a desk where a newspaper has been cut and is in good condition. The clipped articles are recovered using a field kit container. Little else of interest to be brought back is in the bunker as the camera is panned around. Trash bags containing clothing, a few children's toys resembling popular 1950s era products, are lined against the wall. Subject is requested to leave the bunker and then sharply asked to wait by a controller technician who directs the camera view to an area near the exiting doorway to the hatch. Closer inspection, as subject moves in, finds that a small area has been fitted with what appears to be an ethernet jack, the cover of which has been forced slightly away from the wall by a strange amber-like substance. Subject refuses to touch or collect the sample, commenting that it stinks so bad that if they want it, they can come get it themselves. Control declines, and subject leaves bunker. As subject grips the ladder to leave, the camera pans up for a moment, and at the top of the tunnel, a humanoid figure is seen peering down. Control asks subject to confirm figure. Subject states nothing is up there and begins to climb. Figure draws out of camera view after first rung is touched by subject, who ascends without incident. At the top of the tunnel, no other life is seen. Nothing has been disturbed. Subject insists nothing was there and closes the hatch, then immediately vomits. Subject coughs and uses a supplied water bottle to gargle, then freezes and asks if Control is hearing that. Control reports no audio. Subject approaches cellar hatch cautiously with firearm drawn, and lifts her head just enough so camera can view outside area. In the distance, approximately 700 meters from the farm, two massive humanoid beings are crawling across the landscape. The entities do not notice the subject, who remains quiet, but whose drawn sidearm is visibly trembling. Subject requested to remain still and silent as beings move. They are featureless, facing at an angle moving across the field of vision, so the faces are only visible for a few moments. During this time it is clear they have no facial features. The arms they use to drag themselves are short at times and long at others, stretching out to varying lengths each time they move. There is no rear area to the beings. All bodily design appears to end at the torso. The two creatures take approximately ten minutes to disappear into the distance, before the subject begins to panic and begs to return. Request declined. Subject instructed to enter the home from the cellar, and not to leave the home under any circumstances. The first floor is entered through a hatch in the ceiling floor that opens with rusty creaks that cause subject to pause for 37 seconds before continuing upward and entering a kitchen. A heavy layer of dust coats all items in the kitchen. The refrigerator is left open, all food is spoiled. Adjacent to the kitchen is a living area that subject enters slowly. 
There is a recliner, a couch, and a television, all of 1950s style design. In the recliner is a laptop, whose case also resembles 1950s decor, and is coated in heavy dust. Opening the laptop reveals the last moments of its operating system. Faithful OS, leaving a standby mode, and immediately shutting off. Laptop has no external power source, and will not power back on. When asked to recover laptop, it brings the cushion of the recliner with it, the two stuck together. Subject advised to leave laptop where it is. The inside door leaving the home is nailed shut with thick wood planks. No attempt made to interact with these. Camera view pans to a staircase leading upwards. Subject ascends the stairs without being asked, and the stairs remain silent to controls surprise. When subject reaches top of stairs, a hallway with two doors is viewed, one on each side, and at the end of the hall a dumbwaiter is inlaid into the wall. Subject opens door on left on her own, which opens to a master bedroom. The bed is neatly made, but the wardrobe next to it is thrown open and clothes are everywhere on the floor. Subject finds laid out on the bed several pieces of jewellery and is informed to leave them. Subject begins to protest, then comments they stink and leaves them alone, promptly leaving the room. Subject asked to open second door. The second door opens and gives a view of a shared children's bedroom, obviously boy and girl given the types of toys and clothes scattered on the floor. There is also a window which subject approaches and wipes with a curtain to clear dust. Subject requested to move camera to window and does so. The farmland is visible and approximately 40 kilometers from it, at best guess, a city. As the camera starts to draw back, it pans down and films the area around the house. Approximately 300 figures similar to those from the footage captured during the blue test are visible around the house, all staring up. Subject asked to confirm figures, but states nothing is there. Subject requested to return and quickly agrees. Egress from the house is uneventful. Poly system shows no erratic behavior. As subject returns to point to poly wire's origin, a loud groaning noise causes the picture to reverberate. Technicians at control report that they were also able to hear the noise and experienced the vibration. Subject returns through point of origin without investigation, and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 relinquished. Video ends. Returned newspaper fragments filed as... Access SCP-093 violet test. Mirror test 3. Color violet. Subject is D84930, male, 21 years of age, average physique. Subject's background shows instance of second-degree murder of a police officer during a drug bust. Normally, this crime, while severe, would not qualify a person for a sentence that would end up with us. But the murder of the officer was especially brutal, and excessive violence was used. This subject was uncooperative, and had to be reminded that his cooperation would only benefit him. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a violet color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a cityscape, urban, lightly tinged in purple, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera flickers to life and pans around the area. Subject is in what appears to be a modern downtown district, similar to a city like New York. The streets are mostly bare, except for a few cars of unknown make or model. These cars look highly advanced and streamlined. Subject attempts to look into the car windows without being instructed to, but backs away, remarking there is a rank ass stank coming from the areas around most of them. Subject is persuaded to move closer to one car, and does so with coughing, wiping off a window which is covered in dirt. The inside of the car appears to be completely filled with a strange brown matter. There is nothing at all visible other than the brown matter. Two other cars produce the same results, however a fourth vehicle seems more recent than the others, and the insides are immaculate. The doors to this vehicle also are unlocked, and the subject quickly gets inside, then shuts the doors. Subject is chastised for this behavior by Control, who reminds him his lifeline is nothing more than a cable, which is sturdy enough that closing the car door does not injure it, but they cannot recover a person in motion. Subject argues with Control over this issue, and pans the camera across the dashboard, pointing out he couldn't drive away, even if he tried. The dashboard is void of any recognizable controls, no ignition, no steering. It has several small blank screens that are theorized to be a GPS system. Subject remains in the car, while Control discusses how to proceed, since the city landscape is far larger than the previous test destinations. Control debates this issue, while Subject stares around the cityscape from the car. 
During one pan, a face is clearly seen staring into the car, eyes watching the subject. However, this was not noticed until post-test footage review. Subject made no comment regarding this entity at any point. Control shortly after informs subject to remain where he is, and an escort team is dispatched through the mirror to join him. A team of four armed personnel is sent through the mirror and proceeds to subject's location. Subject is then instructed to remove his harness, which is recovered. This subject's video feed then ends and is replaced by a wireless unit used by the escort team. The video quality on this unit is subject to more interference, but in order to mark the mirror exit, a receiver system is placed through the mirror. Subject leaves the car and now travels with the escort team. Given the myriad of possible options, they are instructed to simply move to the closest building and attempt to enter it. This building has etched glass doors bearing the name XEA. Research Partners Inc. and the doors are ajar. A magnetic lock system is present, but has lost power. Team enters the building and main lobby. This area resembles a stereotypical corporate lobby. There is a C-shaped receptionist desk with a chair pushed far from it as if it was left in a hurry. A PC terminal is at the desk as well. Team approaches the desk and the camera bearer is instructed to examine the PC. The unit does appear to have power and faithful OS appears on the screen requesting a login and password. A keyboard is present but is remarkably slim with touch sensitive keys rather than press down keys. After one failed attempt, the lock screen replies that maximum attempts have been exceeded and the PC turns off. No actual tower or power button can be located so team moves forward. Behind the receptionist desk are two elevator doors, one to the left and one to the right, with similar touch sense keys. The elevator on the left is broken, the door open and the shaft empty. The elevator on the right appears functional and has power. Without a clear destination, the team is instructed to proceed to the highest floor to get a lay of the city. All floors appear to be accessible with the highest being 114, in reality 112, as 13 and 113 are missing from the keypad. Journey up the elevator is uneventful during this time. The elevator does appear to take longer as it passes by 13 and then 113, suggesting that entire floor was built and nothing put on it. At 114, the doors open and the team enters a large lounge-type area. There are many couches with dust on them. A wide screen, apparently LCD TV, of approximately 60 plus inches in size, dominates the wall in front of them with no power. A series of windows are open allowing in sunlight at the far end, to which the team proceeds and angles the camera outside. The view of the city is astonishing. This building is one of the tallest visible, but certainly not alone in its stature. The city below is grey and silent, no evidence of life at this altitude. Some buildings in the city have a strange brown growth that appears to have been splashed against them, as if a gelatinous mass was flung and then seeped down before hardening. Other buildings have floors where the glass has been shattered, and the same brown substance is seeping out the edges. One member of the team calls the camera bearer to the windows on the other side. From the other side of the building, the city edges can be seen. Attention is pointed toward an expressway that encircles the city, upon which crawls another of the large half-body humanoids, dragging itself with its elastic arms as witnessed in previous tests. It travels the highway, then moves out of sight. The team returns to the elevator and notes that a button has already been activated for floor 74. No one has approached the elevator, so the team agrees to travel to this floor. On the 74th floor, the doors open and reveal a waiting area to what appears to be a doctor's office. At the reception desk, there is a sign-in sheet with a series of names and dates. The dates on the sign-in sheet all carry the year 1953. A PC at the receptionist area is on and functioning at a user desktop. The background for the PC is a large set of praying hands with the word Faithful OS under them. On the desktop are a series of folders with years on them, containing files that, when clicked using the center button of the mouse, open to a word viewer. All files appear to be appointment information. On the desk is a notepad titled, From the Desk of Dr. Borisitsky, Blessed Purificationist. The door to the doctor's area is sketched with the same name and title, as well as a crucifix. Opening this door leads to a white, dust-free hallway that has two examination rooms and a key-coated door at the end. The examination rooms are unremarkable and typical of any doctor's office. All medicine cabinets are empty. A small amount of C4 is placed at the lock to the key-coded door at the request of control and then blown, forcing the door open. The area it opens into is much larger than the reception area itself and seems to contain a series of large containment capsules. There are a total of six of these capsules. Two are broken and a brownish amber material coats the floor coming from them. One is empty. 
The last three have nude humans floating in them with breathing masks. Attached to the front of these tubes are medical charts showing vital signs and conditions. For symptoms, the charts explain in somewhat awkward English ailments that seem more like flaws of personality or character, or just incidents that have occurred with the patient. Control asks for a zoom of one of the patient pages on the chart. After focusing, it reads, Citizen Jennifer McZirka did suffer a lapse of the heart that did lead her to lay with her neighbor. Twice upon nights of her husband's departure from their home, patient did submit herself into the Lord's and our hands for cleansing of mind and body. Prayer administered by High Father Uwalakin and patient submitted to a three-day period in the Lord's tears to cleanse her system, then released in good spirits. The topmost page reads, Citizen Alberius Farafan struck out at a High Father during a sermon, blaspheming that the Lord's tears did turn his daughter to be unright in mind and heart, thusly laying blame for her whorish activities at the feet of the High Father and his blessing. With no proof of these blasphemies, the forgiving judge and the punishing judge did agree that Alberius Farafan should bathe in the Lord's tears himself for a week to be cleansed of mind and soul, thus to prove his daughter's ways are fault of not the father's hands, and to give him peace of self. Subject, who has been travelling quietly with the escort team, now begins to panic. The camera pans to focus on him, and he is surrounded by entities similar to those witnessed in the first two tests. Escort team reports in that Subject is having a panic attack, but Control requests them to stand still and wait. Subject screams at the entities, which are denied to exist by Team Commander, stating Subject is alone in the corner. Control requests that one team member be dispatched to approach and recover the Subject. The Escort team member approaches the Subject as ordered. On the video, the figures part to make a pathway for the approaching member, who lifts Subject to his feet and brings him out of the corner. Figures on video are then seen closing ranks to close the path. Subject is lifted to his feet by an arm and escorted through the figures that close their ranks when the subject is moved. They remain steadfastly staring at the subject, no matter where he moves to. Control requests the team to return now. Team turns to leave. Before leaving, a team member mentions something noticed at the reception desk, a binder labeled The Lord's Tears. Control requests binder be returned as well, and it is stowed into the subject's field kit. The team returns to the elevator and returns to the ground floor. Upon leaving the building, subject points down the street toward direction of entry point. The camera pans to a section of raised expressway, across which one of the large torsos is crawling slowly. The entity turns its featureless head to look at the escort team, raises its head to the sky, and emits a bellowing sound. Team leader issues the order to move, heading for the spot marked by the wireless video receiver. The creature on the expressway extends an arm down that stretches to touch the ground before the camera moves to the port. All team members save one move through entry point. Subject moves through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 is dropped by subject, who panics and tries to fight his way out of the room. Subject is terminated by team leader after he draws the field kit pistol. Team leader requests portal be reopened, but it takes several minutes to find someone who can hold SCP-093 and generate a similar color. When a matching color is displayed and applied to the mirror, the video receiver is visible and all individuals report a horrific smell. Team leader moves through the entryway with control person. The uniform and possessions of the escort team member who was left behind are present and recovered, but the member himself is nowhere to be seen and does not respond to shouts. Member assumed KIA. And wireless receiver recovered. Control and escort return through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. Later review of the recovered camera shows escort member grasping at the air where entry point should be, and then turning to look up at the oversized torso. A brown gel seems to drip off the creature as it moves, that disappears shortly after being dislodged, as if evaporating. Several shots are fired at the creature's face, with the automatic weapon carried by land in the face of the creature, causing a spray of less viscous brown liquid to pour forth from the wounds. Screams obscenities as the face of the creature descends upon him, and the camera is pushed to the ground. Camera feed remains dark for approximately 65 seconds before light comes back and the camera films the creature crawling back to the expressway and pulling itself onto it, then crawling in the direction it was originally headed. Believed to have been absorbed by the creature and perhaps digested. This may have been an example of how these unknown entities feed by direct contact with living material. Further study is recommended to be avoided on this issue. Returned ledger filed as... Access SCP-093 Yellow Test. Mirror Test 4. Color Yellow. 
The class subjects no longer authorized for testing. Testing focus has been shifted to data collection after analyzing the articles brought back from the previous three tests to better understand the fate of the world accessed by SCP-093 and determine if safeguards or practices are required for our own world. Analysis of the brown fluid on the clothing of the lost escort team member has been filed with other recovered articles. Doctor has volunteered for this test as out of the possible candidates he was able to cause SCP-093 to undergo a new color change. There is no evidence in Doctor the background of any illegal or criminal behavior, nor of any psychological problems. When presented to the mirror, the view changed to that of a cubicle office environment. For this test, Doctor opted to use the wireless video system and forgo the pulley return system, stating he was confident he would be safe, as none of the torso creatures have been witnessed within a building where the mirror's destination showed. Video feed commences after Doctor has crossed the mirror. As with prior tests, SCP-093's current color, yellow, tinges all video material. Camera flickers to life and pans across a series of plain white cubicle constructs. Approximately 30 are visible. At the far end from the point of entry is an office module built into the wall with frosted glass walls and a glass door. Doctor approaches this door and investigates the etched writing on it. Senior Manager Stanley Milamitz. The door is unlocked. Doctor enters the office and examines the desk. A coffee cup is on the desk, a dark brown stain covering half of the inside as the liquid evaporated. There is a donut on a plate, which Doctor picks up and lobs at a wall. On impact, it thumps like a rock and falls. A file cabinet in the corner of the room draws Doctor's attention, and he goes through each shelf one at a time, stopping in the second drawer and taking out a file, then going back to the first and taking out two others. Continuing to the third and fourth drawers, he withdraws four additional files and spreads them all out on the desk. The files are blue filing folders, and he points with his finger and camera at a symbol on each of praying hands, stating aloud for the camera that all other files are stored in yellow folders. The blue folders are placed in his field kit. Camera attention is turned to the PC on the desk that is logged in and functional. Doctor comments aloud, wondering where these devices are getting their power from, as he has noticed no power outlets. This PC's desktop contains the logo of Faithful OS, and even has sounds. Clicks of the mouse followed by soft hymn-like hums, and opening of icons followed by angelic bells. The PC fails to yield any useful information to Doctor, who abandons it and leaves the office. Approaching the other end of the office floor, Doctor presses a button on the wall for the elevator and enters, finding he is on the 34th floor of a building having an unusual number scheme. The keypad layout goes from negative 115 to 115 and includes all floors. Before pressing a floor button, Doctor requests that the wireless video transponder be moved to the elevator and replaced with a construction cone to mark the entry point. A second transponder unit is placed outside the elevator and Control is instructed to recover the second unit and seal the test chamber should something happen to him. Then, when all is arranged, he presses the button for floor negative 115. The descent down the elevator is long, consuming 15 minutes. During this time, the camera experiences one malfunction where the image jerks and turns to snow, restoring to show 14 other figures in the elevator with Doctor. As video pans around, all of whom move as he moves to allow him space. They remain for 35 seconds, then the camera flickers to snow and returns. Doctor is now alone in the elevator, dancing, as is assumed by the ducks and sways of the video feed. Doctor pauses to comment on the rising stench coming from below. At this point, the elevator has reached floor negative 108. Doctor presses negative 110 to interrupt the descent down and exits when that floor is reached. The elevator doors open to an enclosed observation deck with several PCs and chairs. All PCs appear to have power. The ceiling to this deck is also glass, and above it another deck is visible. Doctor approaches the monitoring stations and checks one of the PC screens. On the screen is the Faithful OS logo and a video feed toggling between four different views. The first view is a room of tubes similar to those found in Test Violet, which number in the thousands. The second view is a closer-up view of these tubes as a camera glides in front of each to monitor the contents. All tubes the camera passes by are broken. The third view is facing the opposite direction as a camera glides vertically, checking each observation station. A total of ten can be counted, and Doctor is visible as the camera passes by his own station. Looking up, a hovering camera unit with no visible means of propulsion glides up past him. The fourth view shows the ground floor below the observation deck, where a single astonishingly large torso being is crawling in circles, 
bumping into walls and changing directions. From the camera feed, the creature's estimated size is six stories. Returning attention to the contents of the PC, Doctor moves the video log aside to see a simple text editor that was hidden behind it. A printout of this text was recovered and filed in the field kit. The printout directed Doctor to a safe on floor 54 and provided a combination. Doctor leaves the observation deck and proceeds to 54 without event, arriving on a cubicled office floor. He proceeds to the desk mentioned in the document and found a safe hidden beneath a desk undisturbed. The combination provided opens the safe and reveals a notebook filed in the field kit and a peculiar revolver that has been returned as in addition to the 24 rounds of ammo found with it. Doctor proceeds back to the elevator without event and returns to 34. Given the sheer number of floors available to explore and the vital information obtained from the observation deck, the test is considered over and equipment is retrieved. Before returning through the entry point, Doctor investigates a terminal nearby that has power and finds it shows the exact same screen the one on negative 110 shows. It is theorized that the author of the note installed a network virus to propagate it through the building so any PC on that network would be found and the information discovered. Doctor returns through the entry point and the mirror returns to a reflective surface. All materials filed with other SCP-093 recovered materials. Analysis of and the ammunition for it postponed for reasons that it would require deconstruction of one of the rounds and they may be beneficial until testing of SCP-093 is resolved. Video ends. Access SCP-093 Red Test. SCP-093 Mirror Test 5. Color Red. SCP-093 distributed amongst staff until a new color could be generated by contact with it. Service technician was able to cause SCP-093 take on a fierce red hue and glow, much brighter than the object's normal color. Agreed to assist with a test of SCP-093. Pair Doctor Z's request given to technician for use in this test. When applied to the mirror for the test, SCP-093 generates an unknown environment. No color tinge appears present on the displayed destination, which is comprised of red stonework. Technician enters the mirror and video capture begins. Video flickers to life and technician, known hereafter as subject, is viewing a large cylindrical pillar that is rotating on its own. Object is of unknown height and appears to be 1.8 meters, 6 feet, in width. Holes are distributed throughout the object at seemingly random intervals. On occasion a beam of white light is emitted from these holes. Turning off the camera finds that the beams are connected to a multitude of objects similar to SCP-093 that are part of the room's wall. The room turns out to also be cylindrical in shape, with countless copies of SCP-093. Subject turns back to entry point and finds it is a section of the wall that is missing its copy of SCP-093, presumably the one carried with subject. Other sections of the wall on inspection are also found to be missing their copies, leading to speculation that this may be some sort of central array. Subject finds a ladder in the floor while examining the room and proceeds down it at control's request. The ladder exits into a large clean room full of computer equipment that appears antiquated compared to previously encountered equipment. Large computers running on reel-to-reels are clicking and spinning at various locations. A light bulb of unknown meaning turns on for 10 seconds, then turns off. A large CRT monitor is displaying single words in eight colors at roughly five second intervals. While observed, the words clean, unclean, clean, clean, lost, unclean, flash on the screen. Proceeding through the room, it ends in a large glass window as another observation deck. This deck looks out over another series of tubes as witnessed before, but far fewer and filled with a blue liquid. What appears to be electrical current dances over many of the tubes at erratic intervals. At least five tubes at first glance are empty and broken. At the observation window, a keyboard is present on a pedestal, awaiting a selection to be made. The options available on the screen are Tube Status, which waits for a numerical input, Reports, Situation X549, Situation X550, Evacuation Log, Bullshit, Agent, Report, and Facility Fire Plan. Video expunged. All selections that generated text were transcribed by subject and verified by a control member who passed through the portal to recover them. This process took approximately two hours and video feed was deleted to condense this report. Recorded documents are filed as... Video interrupted. 
Control lost contact with subject approximately 30 minutes after departure of Control Tech. Subject was asked to remain in area and observe the machinery and the containment room to make observations for debriefing. The SCP-093 mirror portal returned to a reflective surface prematurely and all video contact with subject was lost. Control was unable to re-establish due to SCP-093 being across the mirror. A time lapse of 1 minute and 48 seconds, 148, was recorded before mirror portal re-established itself and subject returned through portal. Subject appeared to be in good health and condition despite the time loss, but spoke little. During immediate debriefing, subject underwent sudden convulsions and medical staff was alerted. While attempting to subdue subject, he displayed enhanced strength and used to shoot one of the debriefing staff, killing them. Guards shot subject once with a sidearm in the heart and once in the chest, but subject did not fall. All staff evacuated room and a second shot was fired by subject which missed. A more heavily armed team entered debriefing room and used automatic weapons to dispatch subject. Reports confirm that subject did not bleed when shot, but instead leaked a green-brown substance that seemed to be a mix of solution observed in some containment tubes and the material recovered during test 3. All further SCP-093 tests have been discontinued while review of materials recovered is in effect. A secondary tape recording device was found to have activated in the field kit after loss of video feed and its contents have been filed with other recovered materials. All recovered materials from SCP-093 testing are Level 4 classification. Release must be approved by no fewer than two Level 4 personnel. Access SCP-093 recovered materials. The following data has been classified. Personnel requesting this data must read all declassified test data and have the approval of 2 2 Class 4 personnel. SCP-093 recovered materials. All documents contained in this file are Class 4 clearance requiring two signed approvals to access. Any employee reading past this point who does not have proper classification should consider themselves to be terminated from employment and now subject to disciplinary actions up to and including forced administration of Class A amnesiac, immediate transfer to Keta Class security, and death. Blue test. Newspaper article 1. Only one item could be recovered during our initial test, and that was a newspaper clipping found attached to a corkboard in an abandoned bunker. Most of the articles were in a state of decay, but one was firm enough for recovery. Most Holy Father announces progress, unclean being cleansed. A rare public address directly from the Most Holy Father of the United Lands of the Sun has declared that the Blessed Militia has driven back many of the unclean who are skulking our lands now. New Rome, our capital, has been purged of the unclean, and citizens are encouraged to come back to their homes. Citizens who live in the surrounding countryside should not return to their farms, as the unclean still roam the fields and plains around our glorious city and continue to grow in size. The Blessed Militia has developed new weapons which have proven capable of punishing the unclean and driving them back into the unfertile lands. Construction has begun of a system to permanently close the unfertile lands off from our blessed lands in each affected area once all the unclean have been driven away. The Most Holy requests that all citizens of our United Lands bow in prayer and offer tithe to recognize the sacrifices of our Blessed Militia in these troubled times. Reports have been coming in that falsely accuse the Blessed Militia of having committed sin against the citizens whose homes they are inhabiting as they travel bravely through contaminated lands. The Most Holy would like to remind the people that blasphemy against any who wear his mark is the most grave of sin and unfounded accusations will be punished accordingly. We should work to support he and his men, however possible, just as they lay down their lives for us. The Sinful Rebels Who Green Test Newspaper Articles 2, 3, 4, Diary Our second test recovered many materials that helped to establish a sequence of events for this alternate world. The diary recovered provided a glimpse into the last days of the owners of the home from which it was recovered, and may represent activity in other areas of the world as well. Newspaper Article 2 Farms surrounding the city of Silver Feathers have reported being unable to contact neighbors across voice or video feeds in the last week. Until an approval is granted by the regional High Father, an investigation cannot commence, but he assures the people that the events have not escaped his attention. Residents are advised to notify their local Blessed Voice daily, so that any further disappearances can be addressed immediately. Residents are also advised to begin stocking their shelters to be ready for any situation. Newspaper Article 3 
Following the disappearance of the blessed voices from several outlying regions around the city of Silver Feathers, the regional High Father has declared a concern for safety and livelihood. Under this declaration, all farmland residents must evacuate immediately to their shelters. Scattered reports of an unclean have come in, but have yet to be verified. Newspaper Article 4 The City of Glorious Song has stopped responding to any and all communications. The worst can only be assumed, and our hearts go out to any who are in the region who are unable to hear our words. The City of Silver Feathers, Blessed Militia, has reported several incursions by the unclean into the city, and have exterminated four of the abominations before they could become a danger to any residents. The regional High Father reminds the citizens to avoid direct confrontation with the unclean. Conventional arms do nothing to the unclean. Only the most holy of implements will penetrate their sin, so do not put yourself in danger. Any citizens who suspect their neighbors indulging in heavy sin should immediately contact the Blessed Militia through designated checkpoints. Diary I have the distinct feeling we're going to die, so I'm going to write this all down for whoever comes along and finds our bones. My name is Herverf Yukulsiv, and I'm a farmer. I grow the rapsticks and the huskiers. We raise the inks and the ooms. It's me, my wife, or fairy, and our two lilans, Threven and Listeria. I got this book in trade from the blessed man who came for food and shelter. He told us to start getting our shelter ready, and not to let no other blessed who coming by even know we're here. Says the whole thing break down, nothing right no more. So I does, as he said, get it all ready. We going down there in the next day or so. In the morn, he was gone, which made the wife sad as he was polite to us, unlike most of the others. Figure he didn't want to be no birder. Liz went out looking for him, just to be sure he weren't just round the house. He didn't turn up nowheres, so we guess he left. Strange enough, Liz found his clothes round a mile or so away, and all his gear, but no him. She left it all there, and thus for the best, if what happened, that I think. I'm clearly no educated man, don't claim to be, but I can put two and two together, and tell you the things are bad out there. For everyone, and especially for us, because it's coming way too close. Sometimes you can smell it, that's when we hide. Smells like a leg of meat that's been rotten for way too long, and just won't go back into the dirt. Even the soil is rejecting them, I guess, refusing to let them be buried to die. It came. Too fast, we weren't ready. The smell came in the night. Maybe we would have been fine, but the Lillans were afraid, so we went to the shelter. Trev was slow. He saw it, kept staring at it as it shambled by. It ignored us until he screamed, when I was getting Liz and the Miss down in the shelter. I went to get him, but... It was too fast. I saw him standing up there, screaming, and then its head came down on him, pressed over him. He tried to run for the stairs, tried to get to us, but then, in a blink, he was gone, and it pulled away. His clothes fell into the cellar like he vanished out of them. I got into the shelter, slammed the hatch, and locked it. I think it knows we're here now. It'll try to get in. Take us, too. No telling how long we got. Plenty of food, though. I was wrong. The food was rotten. Something got into it, or I just didn't notice. We're eating what we can. There's food, but not enough, and that thing ain't leaving. It's trying to find ways in, smelt the smell, coming from the life web plugging the wall. Something seeped through it, and we kept away. It got all hard like a rock, and don't smell no more. Maybe the power in the plug finally let it die. I went up to peek. Cellar is fine, Trev's clothes still on the stairs. Peeked outside. We're not going to make it. There were ten, twenty, thirty. Couldn't count, so many, all going in a circle around the house, looking at it with those faceless faces, and the stink, oh, the stink. Went back into the shelter and locked the door. I think I don't want to see my family rot away. I think faster is better. The miss, she agrees. We won't tell this. She'll be first, then my wife, my love, then me. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I gave the best life to my family possible. It was them holy ones who brought this. I'm going to pen this in memory to my great pap. He was old and knew stories older than himself. Says those unclean they preach about, those unfertile zones they say stay out of. All cause of the most holy bringing the world together. Them things are the ultimate sin. Everything about us that was evil and impure, it's them. They don't know nothing but doing what they do. Don't even know why they do it. They just do it. Take us into them, then we're gone. I asked Pap what they were, and he lit a stick, took a puff, and he said, Don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody who'll admit it. But if you see this symbol, if you see it, 
You run, boy. You run fast. You run far. And you hide. And you never go back where you saw it. That's all I know. I remember the symbol was on the rock he kept on his neck under his shirt. Next day, Pap was gone. Nowhere to be found. Dad went sad. Said he knew it had happened one day. Pap went home. See you soon, Dad. Pap. Data expunged. Symbol matched. Symbol found on SCP-093 surface as one of the deeper engravings. Also matches symbol noticed on video feed of final test on SCP-093 duplicates. Violet test. Office ledger. The third test with SCP-093 resulted in the unfortunate loss of a security member, but also allowed us to recover a ledger with insight into the medical procedures carried out on the alternate Earth now termed E-093. Patient, Jennifer McZirka. Recovery tube, 00101. Mixture, 35% tears, 30% nutrient, 10% HFT, 25% blessing. Summary. Jennifer McZirka is 20 cycles of age, and during her 18th cycle was the victim of a half right accident that resulted in brain damage and misalignment of her moral processes. She is prone to violent outbursts and can only be calmed down by impure stimulation. Because of this, she actively seeks out strangers to mingle with, and her parents have requested of the High Father that she be sent to the Tears to mend her mind and body. Patient accepted. During preparation for the Tears, subject went into a rage and the attending hand went to recover a sedative. Jennifer tore her clothes off and screamed impure words at me, so I locked the door and instructed the hand to wait outside. I am half shameful to admit I laid with Jennifer a total of seven times before putting her to the tears. It has been very long for me, and her parents have abandoned her to our care, so care for her I will. Before setting her to the tears, I authorized a blessed probe of her body functions, and found she is settled now with young, and tests confirm it shall be mine. I have mixed her bath to accommodate this, and she will soak in the tears until her body is ready to give life. Patient. None. Recovery tube. 001-2. Mixture. None. Summary. None. Patient. Alberius Farafan. Recovery tube. 001-3. Mixture. 80% tears, 20% nutrient. Summary. Alberius Farafan is a farmer from outside the city of Silver Feathers who claims to have lost family to the unclean. He confronted the High Fathers of the city and demanded compensation and retribution for the loss. The High Fathers deny the existence of unclean beyond the unfertile lands and refuse compensation or retribution. Alberius struck a High Father and was arrested and sentenced to a cleansing of the soul. His mixture is primarily tears to seep into the soul and cleanse his heart and ease his pain. The lawkeepers state his family is indeed missing, so his sentence beyond the tears has been dropped in sympathy for their loss. I used the last of the HFT. On Jennifer, or I would have used less tears in this bath. 80% is higher than I am comfortable with, but the HFT is becoming hard to obtain. I may have to go through the dark. Patient. Recovery tube 002-1. Mixture, 75% nutrient, 25% blessing. Summary, a member of the blessed militia who was wounded in combat. Request is from the High Father, details withheld. Patient. Recovery tube, 002-2. Mixture, 75% nutrient, 25% blessing. Summary, a member of the blessed militia who was wounded in combat. Request is from the High Father. Details withheld. Patient. Recovery tube 002-3. Mixture 75% nutrient, 25% blessing. Summary. A member of the Blessed Militia who was wounded in combat. Request is from the High Father. Details withheld. Yellow test. PC printout. Safe diary. The fourth test into E-093 provided us with documentation assumed to be written by a technician in either a medical or government facility. Found in the safe, is being considered for SCP classification primarily due to the composition of the ammunition found with it and the advanced firing mechanism attached to what should be a very base firearm. PC printout. I did not trust the overwatchers. I felt something was wrong years ago. Under my desk on floor 54 is a safe with a weapon in it. It is one of those used by the Blessed Militia. My brother has sent it to me. He says they are also not what they claim. 
they have done things to our fellows even more vile than what the unclean would do. He tells me to be ready to fight. I cannot. It is not me. I do not know violence. I am too frail. You, use it. Save yourself. Save diary. My name is Harvel Pellewis. I am a hard systems watcher here. My job is to monitor the sinful who bathe in the Lord's tears, and then make sure that they reach the prescribed dilution time. I have been doing this job for twenty-three years, and now things are falling apart. I can no longer abide by the most holy. I must speak the truth. We are being told to evacuate. The containment tubes have been breached. An unclean has appeared in the place of rest, and we are unable to destroy it. The live motion footage shows how it came to be, and this is what has unsealed my heart and mind and tongue. I must speak. Should the overwatchers see this, I will be silenced, so I must hide it. Thankfully, they are ignorant with the hardware, so I can hide this easily. The overwatchers told us we should leave last, to ensure the hardware contains the unclean. What that means is, we should distract it and die in case it breaches the watching decks. It has shattered nearly all the tubes and absorbed the people in them. I have dispatched the eyes to the unclean, and they have touched it, bringing me back a sample of it. The unclean are not sinners, they are not products of our disobedience. I suspect they are us. The eyes have dated the sample. It is older than myself, older than my elders. It is over two hundred cycles in ages. Two hundred! The sirens are still sounding, but no signal has come for us to leave. I do not think this unclean is alone. I have seen how they can get into places, between places. Between places? Is that where they have been, all this time? Between places? The makeup of the unclean is unstable. Molecules detach and reattach almost before my eyes, as if to move the entire thing reforms itself in space and time. Why does it not come up here? Too much effort? Or does it not sense me? They have no eyes, no mouth, no face, they cannot speak, cannot see, but they must be able to sense us. The smell, it is so strong, it comes from all directions. It is not a smell of the dead, it is a smell that comes from something that should be dead, but does not know how to die. The War of the Holy Union, I think that was where it may have started. We are united under the Most Holy, but what does he owe us? Nothing. We merely keep society running while those on high benefit. Is this not how it has always been? But now we are told we are pleasing the will of those above us in the clouds, those great beings who gave us the power to live and prosper, those who we have never laid eyes upon, but are told we must revere. Lies, all of it, it must be. I am using the eyes to create a fluid to oppose the makeup of the unclean's sample. Perhaps they will cancel each other out. I will leave soon and store the rounds here. I cannot use the weapon. I am too weak a man for this. I will protect my family with my mind, and not with my rage. We will be safe in the fields. I know where to go. I will go above now, to my family. I will leave the hardware running. I was told to turn it off. But this is where I defy them. It will run. This will watch. The eyes will see for however much time they have. Someone will read this, and someone will know. Take the gun. Take the fluid. Do not listen to the Most Holy. We did, and we are damned is a revolver-style weapon with two 12-bullet cylinders. The design of the gun has one cylinder on each side, raised slightly, so they may flip into the gun itself and then rotate, firing all rounds before flipping back out and allowing it to be reloaded, while the second is usable, allowing a total of 24 shots before it runs empty. There is no firing pin on this gun, but instead there is a pull-back slide mechanism that must be used to prime the active cylinder. At the time of recovering, all 24 slots contain a syringe-style bullet with 32 needles on the end. On impact, it is assumed the force of the shot will press the liquid inside into the target. None have been tested. Of express interest is that these cylinders can hold standard 45 caliber ammunition, which has been tested. The gun uses an ultra-high power magnetic rail system to deliver the shot, so the gunpowder in the bullet is never used. In consideration is a redesign of a round that would utilize the gunpowder mid-flight to add even higher velocity to the round, or that would explode on impact for higher yield. Red test. PC printouts. The final authorized test with SCP-093 resulted in the loss of a skilled service technician, but allowed us to recover very revealing documents that can only be assumed to not have been intended for public knowledge in any world. Curious among these is Agent Report, which appears to have been written by a Foundation employee several decades ago. While these paper printouts were the best material recovered, 
It seems that the system used to create them allowed for multiple formats of input, including typed and verbal speech to text. Some audio logs of the printouts below are available, but must be requested in advance with fully written explanations as to why. This dual input system seems to explain the variances in the style between users as well, with assumptions made on the part of the software while performing conversions. Facility Fire Plan in the event of any emergency requiring the facility to be evacuated, all Clear 4 staff should report to train station 3 and use their vial to call the evacuation train. Only one vial is required to call the train and may contain any amount of tears. An empty vial will not call the train. Clear 2 and 1 staff should remain at their posts until either 10 minutes after the departure of Clear 4 persons or until authorized by Clear 4 staff. Clear 3 staff should utilize the protective garments at their stations and weapon lockers before proceeding to designated crisis areas as dictated by Clear 4 staff. Reports Three unfertile zones have increased 25% in size in the last seven days. Containment teams are not finding any presence of unclean in these zones, but they are visibly confirmed as expanding. Clear 5 level High Fathers have confirmed breaches in the Holy Chambers at each of these zones, all chambers found empty. It is believed that the unclean have breached containment on the Holy Chambers. Dispatching additional guard to remaining chambers. Situation X549 Expansion of Zone 6-4-TO has been confirmed. Unfertile zone containment procedures in effect. Containment staff dispatched to site. This is the 10th report in 30 days, upgrading to situation status. Reports from Clear 5 High Fathers have stopped at all affected. The city of his word has been placed on full lockdown and all travel denied in or out. Other cities are now in alert mode, and combat teams are being dispatched to city perimeters. Situation X-550 The great land of Hufusia has fallen per satellite images. Entire landmass considered tinted. Outbreak of sin reported in Levina, and that landmass has requested assistance from the Holy Union. Assistance denied due to our own outbreak and mass reportings of unclean. Clear 10 staff have issued the order to evacuate via the gateway for all Holy Union authorized persons to proceed to the nearest sky platform for evacuation to Star Eye Eden to continue monitoring status. Gateway keys are being ejected to prevent spread from this center to other space-time vectors. Resurrecting staff are being awakened to monitor and continue reports here as we evacuate. May his blessings forgive our greatest sin. Evacuation log. Evacuation in progress. Shuttle 1 away. Shuttle two away. Shuttle three error 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 error. Release us release us release us. Why why why? Shuttle three error launch aborted. Proceed to shuttle four. Shuttle four reported delayed launch overloaded. Triage protocols engaged. Shuttle four reports passenger limit obtained. Preparing to launch. Why why why? Release us why release us why? What did we do why? System detecting electrostatic activity. Compensating compensating com 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 com. Why were we hurt? What did we do? Why were we hurt? What did we do? System shut down. System restore purge of contaminated data in progress. Why us? Why us? Why us? Why us? Why us? Why us? Why Listen. Record 5432-104-392. Password. Forgive. 5554443322222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222222
I have run from the unclean as they pursue anything they sense. I have no understanding of how they hunt, but I have learned what they are. Approximately 350 years ago or so, this world experienced a technological boom ours did not. The source of this seems to have been the arrival of He, a godlike being of unknown origin. He declared the world unclean and full of sin, and the only way to purge itself of this sin was to purge the sinners. A war, whoever was left alive, was clean. Amazing advances in science were bestowed to all cultures for a period of ten years to prepare them for this war, and during that time he disappeared. The war happened anyway. The instigator, the Holy Union of Land, apparently the land mass that for us would become the United States. Records are sketchy, and books that detail anything about this time period are forbidden in the world. I located a cache of recorded history by following a series of corrupted computer communications. It seems the primary weapon used in this war for his love was, in fact, people. Exposed to something called His Holy Tears, a liquid compound I have seen in use even today in abandoned medical facilities. His Holy Tears purge the sin from the unclean and make them love him. At least, that's what the label states. The records I recovered are very unclear about how this war was waged, except to state, His Holy Chosen walked the lands of the sinful and took their sin unto themselves. Those who cried for his salvation received it and are now our children. Those who denied his love were purified in his radiance. But something apparently happened no one knew how to deal with. The unclean, the large creatures that are half a man and devour whatever they touch that lives and breathes. I actually found a scientific report written by someone who stumbled here with an SCP-093 copy. These creatures are the result of exposure to a very pure form of his tears, resulting in a genetic apocalypse occurring within the exposed. There are terms in here, something about quantum restructuring. I don't understand any of this, but it means they were once humans like everyone else, that couldn't be controlled. But they could be contained. They seemed to be attracted to his tears, and a central point was established in various regions where a person with the purest form of his tears stays, keeping the unclean in that area known as an unfertile land. Something went wrong with that, too. Not sure what, but everything fell apart. The power structure, the culture, the people, all of it fell to ruins, and now those things shamble around the land as its new owners, with no purpose or direction. You can stand next to one if you can stand the stink, and they just slip right past you. If you catch their attention, though, that's it. They move like lightning if they need to, and like a snail unless they have a reason to speed up. Sometimes I think they chase just to do it. Others, they move to kill. I think someone is in this facility, or someone's. I keep hearing voices and requests coming from areas under the floor. I want to leave this before I explore the facility any further. I have sent SCP-093 back through the entry mirror to seal that gate. These things can't be let into our world, nor should we have anything to do with this one. We're simply not smart enough to understand it all, I feel. I don't think the unclean can die. They're immortal, but they don't want to be. They just want to die. They're... in my head, I think. I didn't notice it till just now, but equipment in this room is starting to react to me. Words on the screen, begging for help. I... I remember touching the tears, smelling it, tasting it, just a touch. Not eating it, just touching to it, tasting for acidity. We have pretty stupid investigative procedures, I think. Uh -huh. The High Fathers are... alive. They have technology we can only imagine in our comics given by him. Some of the records on this machine indicate space travel, but they didn't go far, just far enough to watch the world fall apart and wait to come back and take it. But if they're up there... Who is in this building with me? I've seen the faces of the people, the unclean. They show up on the pictures cast by the machine, in the room with me, watching me. I think they're everywhere on this world, only seen by machines now. They don't look sad or happy, just curious. They want to know why, why them, why did it all happen? I don't know. I just don't know. They showed me things when I touched them, and it's not quite like the records say. The unclean remember it all. Every person they touch becomes part of them, safe inside them, but dead to us. Every mind, every feeling, every terror, it's eternal to them. I kind of want to join them, but... Too much to do. They want me to... Find him, kill him. There was no war. It was him, 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 it. It. 
It came from between the folds of time and space and worlds and light and dark. Something that is but should not be slipped in and called out to them as their god. And they believed it, and they tasted it, and touched it, and laid with it, and became its property, and did its will, and it is still here. The SCP-093. It brought with it, pulled forcefully with it, built it, I don't know, they don't know. But it belongs to him. It lets him move between places, between worlds, so I broke it. <laughs> I threw pieces of it away and threw holes, so these doors are closed, just like ours is closed. And I can't go home, so what else can I do? It calls out through the rock. Somehow, it knows where they are, but can't touch them. But if you hide the rock, he can't call out, and he's stuck too. I got you, you son of a bitch. I got you, bang, bang. <laughs> I touched him. With my fist. And my gun. And he fell down. But he'll get back up. Soon. I'm sorry. I did all I could. Let me sleep now, please. Let. Me. Sleep.